Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. In this series, focusing on highland fungi, Dr. Roberts discusses perhaps the most common fungi that you will see in the clinical laboratory and a significant cause of disease in immunocompromised patients, including transplant patients. This module examines septate highland hyphae. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. First, we're going to discuss how to make mounts for a fungal culture so that we can make an accurate identification. This image you see here actually is representative of what happens in the laboratory many times where a plate is contaminated with many organisms and you need to figure out how to identify those that are present. The next image shows you a schematic of what you might see. This is a drawing with fungi exhibiting all the different kinds of spores that might be produced. Maybe not all, but a lot of them. It gives you an idea of what you might expect to find with certain of the cultures. And it's, I kind of call it the universal fungus because it has everything there. You can notice in, this, uh, in the center there's a tall stalk with a round sac at the top. And this is a sporangium of a, with the zygomycetes. Then we go from there down to penicillium, which is like about 2 o'clock, which has different type of sporulation. And you can just look around in there and see that many of these fungi sporulate differently. And so we will begin to look at some of these as we go along. The first preparation that can be used in the clinical laboratory, and probably the most widely used, is the Scotch tape preparation. Basically what you do is to take a piece of scotch tape and tear off a piece and fold it up so that the adhesive side is, is facing downward. And what you do is you touch the colony with that piece of scotch tape. You stretch it out and place it on a slide that has a drop of lactophenol aniline blue on it. The scotch tape will then stick to the slide and it will allow the fungus to be stained with the dye that you see in the center there. This is an example of where you might end up taking a scotch tape prep from the wrong place. Many times if you take it from the very center of the colony, that's the oldest part of the culture and that's where it sporulates the most heavily. In this case, this is what happened. You see all these spores in here and it's difficult to see because there are so many of them. The bottom line is what you need to do to make a good mount is to make them out from an area that is in between the, the outside advancing edge of the culture and the center of the culture growing up. So it's kind of in the middle. Now this is an example of what you would like to be able to see. This is an organism that has all the spores attached to the canidae for the way they were grown up. This is what the Scotch tape prep allows you to be able to do. If you get it from the right place in the culture, you will see the spores that are attached just as they were growing in the culture. They're attached to the Scotch tape and then you can see exactly how they're produced and exactly how they look. And in this way, you can be able to get an idea of what it is that you're dealing with. Another kind of time-honored uh, preparation is the wet mount. This is where you take a little bit of the colony, you cut it out of the auger with a wire that's been at a right angle, and you take a little bit of the colony along with some of the supporting auger, and you place that on a slide with some lactophenol and on blue. This is an example here of where you see the piece of auger that has been taken up along with the culture. One of the things you have to remember is that it's easy to get too much of the supporting auger on the slide. If you do that, when you put the cover slip on, if it's too large, what it will do is it will fly out from underneath the culture slip onto the top of the bench where you're working, and that's not what you want it to do. So you have to take a smaller piece. Here you can see the cover slip is going on there, and it will be flattened out unless it's too large, and you'll be able to see the culture kind of as it's been growing. The problem is, with a mount like this is the spores don't stay connected to where they were attached. The pressure that you put down with a pencil eraser or some other object on there to flatten that out causes them to disassociate from the hyphae or the canidae for that they're produced on. Probably the Scotch tape prep is the most universal one right now and the wet mount may be second and then as a last result we have in the past used what's called a slide culture or a micro slide culture. This is an example of what that is. Basically, when you have a problem with a culture and you, you need to see how it produces the spores in detail, what you do is to take a plate 
of 2% agar, it's just water agar, and you place a glass rod that's sterile in there, or you can just lay a slide on top of the agar like you see here. It's slide sterile, and what you do is you take a little bit of the culture and you cut out like a circle or like a square with a wire or with a sterile test tube. Place the agar plug on the slide in two places, either end. And then you inoculate the four quadrants of the plug with the culture. Then you put a cover slip on top of it. And as it grows, it produces spores just the way it does in the culture, but they'll be underneath that cover slip. And then what you can do, when you think the culture is mature, is you can remove the cover slip, take it off, put it on a slide with some lactophenol in and blue, and look at it underneath the microscope. And you probably will see the spores just as they have been produced underneath that cover slip. Sometimes you, you happen to look at it too early so that you don't see things you, that you need to see. And that's why we have a second plug on there. You can go back and put a, a cover slip on top of that first plug and let it grow longer if you like to. Here's where you take the cover slip off and put it on a slide with a drop of lactophenol in on blue. And then take a look at it underneath the microscope. This is the cheap way to do it. It works well. You take a piece of filter paper, put it in a sterile petri dish break an applicator stick that's sterile in two and then put the slide on there with a couple of auger plugs and inoculate it put a cover slip on top and let it grow and you put some water in the bottom so that there's enough humidity in there and that filter paper will absorb the water one approach to identifying the highland septate moles is to look at the way they sporulate and see how the canidia are produced and how they're arranged and we're going to start off with the simplest mode of reproduction of the fungi, and that is with the production of arthrocanidia. We will look at some of the fungi that will produce arthrocanidia and see how they are produced and see how they are grouped together. So we'll start off with septate highland hyphae, and if you see canidia or arthrocanidia produced in clusters, we'll go that direction. The first one we'll talk about is geotricum. Some people pronounce it as geotricum. In this case, you see highland septate hyphae, and you find arthrocanidia that are produced within those hyphae. And there are no budding cells produced at all, and just for all you're going to see are rectangular arthrocanidia lined up in a, in a row. This is an example of, of that, just that, where you see the rectangular arthrocanidia lined up within the hyphae. And this is the simplest mode of reproduction of the fungi, is to produce arthrocanidia. And it's a non-specific trait for most of the fungi, but if you find consistently large numbers of these like we're, we're seeing here, then you know that you're dealing with geotricum. And here you see arthrocanidia that are more rounded uh, rather than rectangular. And that does happen with some of the cultures. However, you can see about 6 o'clock, you can see one that is rectangular. Some are round, some are oval, some are rectangular, but nevertheless they're in chains, or at least they're light in a long linear fashion within a hyphal strand. Here you see an example of rectangular arthrocanidia, and they're, they're very long actually, and they're just lined up. They're lined up one after another. You'll see in the dimorphic fungi that there are alternate arthrocanidia, where there's a space between each arthrocanidium. Well, in this case, with uh, geotricum, you do see a little space between them, but it's not what we call alternate arthrocanidia. They don't produce a dead cell in between them. These are just arranged in a linear fashion. Here you see some more arthrocanidia, and they just kind of disassociated from each other, but this is an example of uh, geotricum. This is a cornmeal auger plate, a view of a, through a microscope looking at a cornmeal auger plate. Some places still look at uh, yeast uh, as they're grown on, on cornmeal auger, and you have to be very careful when you're doing this because you never know what it is you're working with, and it's kind of risky to look at a culture without working under, under a hood. However, the cornmeal auger, you have to just look at it through the microscope and look at the morphology through a, an objective without a cover slip. And sometimes you put a cover slip over a, an area that's been streaked. But what you see here are arthrocanidia and chains. And that would be an example of geotricum. Uh, one of the difficulties is that we still see an organism called trichosporin. And trichosporin is, is a, a fairly common cause of disease. And it produces not only arthrocanidia, but it produces blastocanidia. And blastocanidia are just budding cells. So you would look around and see if you see any budding cells. And this would make a difference in what you would call the organism. 
This is an example here where you see the arterial canidae that have been totally disassociated and some of them have germinated and they almost look like a hockey stick. And this is a non-specific trait but it does help to put you in a ballpark when you're looking at one of these organisms and it's kind of characteristic of uh, Geotricum. This is another example of the arthro of Geotricum and you can see here that these are more rounded yet they are still in, arranged in a linear fashion within the hyphal strand. So don't be surprised if you happen to see some that are not rectangular. This is a culture of Geotricum and many times it is mistaken for being a yeast because it has this glabrous, small, smooth appearance to it, a yeast-like appearance to it. And uh, people get confused and think that, it's, that it is a yeast and it's a yeast-like organism. And here you see what happens if the culture grows a little longer, it becomes very powdery. And so it is, truly is a mold, it's not a yeast. But initially it does look like a yeast. This is another plate. You can see this plate is totally uh, confluent growth in the whole plate. And it looks a little feathery around the edge. I don't think it's necessarily characteristic of Geotricum, but at least uh, you can see that they don't all look alike. And here's another one where it's kind of powdery. And, they, and when you see uh, cultures that are a, a bit powdery like this one, it usually means that they're producing large numbers of spores. Let's talk about the fungi that produce Canidia in different ways than we just talked about other than arthral Canidia. I mean, some that are going to be produced in clusters, some that are produced along the sides of the hyphae. And this is a, this diagram you see here shows you a long stalk, the Canidia for with a cluster of Canidia at the tip. And there are a number of organisms that have that produced Canidia in clusters like you see here, and there are ways to differentiate them. With the highland moles, there are times when you see nothing more than just Canidia being produced right off the sides of a hyphal strand. Sometimes in the same culture, you'll see some of the spores are large and some are small. Hence, you call them macro and micro canidia. So you have to look at everything when you try to identify these organisms. So we'll look and see what we come up with. This is a culture plate here of an organism. And what's happened is you can notice that it looks kind of a, kind of yeast-like. But in the center, you see some things that are kind of look like micro colonies in there. Those are probably colonies of bacteria that are sitting on top of there. Here you see clusters of canidia, just like you saw in the diagram a minute ago, that are produced at the tip of a long canidia fore, if you will. A canidia fore is a general term. When we see an organism like this, the long stalk more than likely is going to be a specialized structure called a phyllid. And a phyllid gives rise to canidia, and they are produced in clusters like you see here. What we're going to talk about is acrimonium. Acrimonium has these long tapering phyllids that sometimes arise just from a hyphal strand or from bundles of hyphae, collection of hyphae that you see. The hyphae are very small, very delicate. Sometimes they're all grouped together in bundles. You find canidia, that are spores that are produced in balls at the tip of these phyllids. And if you look closely, you'll see that they are at the tip of the phyllid, they are produced in slimy balls. There's some gelatinous type material that holds those spores together in that cluster. And they're easily disassociated when you make them out trying to, to look at them underneath the microscope. So this is an example of acrimonium. And sometimes you, what you see is what you see here. You're looking down on top of these uh, phyllids with the clusters of canidia at the top and they look like balls sitting there. And if you follow it down there's a long phyllid going all the way down to a hyphal strand. And they don't all always look so good. This is a better example of what it would look like typically. These are long phyllids and at the tip there are clusters of these elongated canidia that are in a gelatinous mass that holds those spores together. And if you look at the, the hyphal strands that go across from about maybe 7 o'clock to towards 3 o'clock and 3.30, you notice that some of those are there grouped in bundles right there. If you look closely, you'll see that there are several hyphae that are just kind of laying on top of each other. And that's what we talk about with the bundling. And these are small hyphae, and they look like the hyphae of a, of a, uh, a dimorphic organism. And there's some association between these, these organisms and molecularly in terms of genetics of these organisms. 
This organism, Acrimonium, is a known pathogen, and we have recovered it actually from blood cultures, and so it's caused systemic disease. This is a larger view showing you the bundling, and we were talking about going all the way across from left to right, or right to left, and then you see the phyllids that give rise to the clusters of conidia at the tip. And when you make a mount, like a Scotch tape preparation, those conidia generally stay together in that cluster. But if you wake up, make a wet mat and try to put a cover slip on top of a piece of the auger and so on and push the cover slip down, those conidia actually spread apart and it's hard to tell that they ever were in a, in a cluster at the tip. This is another one showing you a long stalk, a long phyllid, and then you see the conidia uh, sitting there in a, in a cluster and they're elongated. Now we have to worry about another organism, one called Fusarium, that will produce similar type uh, arrangement of spores or conidia in there. And so we'll have to deal with that one. If you notice this culture has a bit of a lavender tint to it, kind of depending on the angle that you look at it. And this is a culture of an organism called Fusarium, which also produces these uh, conidia and clusters at the tip of a long stalk or a phyllid. And Fusarium produces two types of conidia. One group would be larger and the others are smaller. The macro conidia are, are the large ones and they are kind of canoe shaped and the micro conidia are small and oval, a bit like you see with uh, Acrimonium. The conidia 4 is kind of short and has a, a phyllid that has a taper at the tip of it. Sometimes you look at the end of it, you will see that there's a little bit of a collar or a ring around it, but that's not very obvious. They're called collarettes. The macro conidia, the large ones, have one to five septations, and so they're divided up into compartments. And they have a foot cell that attaches it to uh, conidia form. And the micro conidia are kind of kidney shaped, and they're much smaller, and they have one or two septations. So they're different than acrimonium, but sometimes they're confused. Now, here's a better one. You can see the lavender color of this. The fusarium produces kind of a reddish to purple color, and sometimes it just produces a colony that's yellow. It's another one of those examples where looking at the colonial morphology doesn't always tell you the story. It doesn't always help you all that much because they vary so much. This is fusarium, and at first glance it would look like acrimonium. These conidia that you see at the cluster in a cluster at the tip of this long phyllid are more elongated in shape and they are like macro conidia of fusarium. This is a long phyllid and if you look at it you'll see that it's pointed at the tip and then at the, at the tip of that uh, phyllid you see this cluster of conidia, macro conidia that are kind of canoe shaped and not so much so in this particular view but they are in, in real life but you see they're in a cluster. And so first glance, somebody would say that looks like acrimonium. Well, it's not. It's fusarium. And this is fusarium. And there are the, there's a good example of the bundling of those hyphae. You can see they're small. And they're as small as a, as a hyphae of a dimorphic organism. And you can see the phyllids in there. Some of them do not have anything at the tip of them at all. They've been, spores have been knocked off. About 8 o'clock, you can see that there are some tapered phyllids and the conidia are in a cluster at the tip of those. And here is Fusarium that shows you a very good uh, example of these canoe-shaped macro conidia. These are very long, as a matter of fact. Notice the hyphae septate, but when you start to look at the conidia, the spores that are in there, you'll see two things. One is you see these chlamydo conidia, those ones at about maybe 8 o'clock, getting toward 9 o'clock, the two round cells in the hypal strand. Those are not specific spores for the most part although there is one fusarium that is characteristically produces a lot of these chlamydo conidia. But for the most part, what we're going to see are macro conidia like you see here. And these are very elongated and canoe shaped, like we mentioned before. And so this is what you would see with fusarium. Fusarium is a very important pathogen, and we're seeing it more and more often in immunocompromised patients, particularly those who've had organ transplants. And cause some very serious disease and they a lot of tissue invasion and a lot of necrosis and, and dying of the cells occurs as a result of this organism being present in the tissue. So this is one you need to really know about and if you find it from a normally sterile site you need to make a phone call real quick. 
This is a cluster of those macro canidae at the tip of a phyla. It's kind of hard to see what the phyla, top of the phyla looks like, but there are the macro canidae, and they're not as obviously canoe-like as the ones you just saw. But here you see some that are, and uh, these are just macro canidia of a fusarium. There are many species of fusarium, and if you're asked to put a name on a species name on these, I would probably try to avoid doing that at all costs. It's too much trouble. It takes a lot of time and effort. If you don't have the expertise, you probably won't get it right anyway. So there's no need to probably do that clinically unless someone wants to write a case up. What you see here are just examples of these macro canidia that are actually multi-septate, and they are canoe-shaped, and they, uh, they vary in length. You can see this one is very detailed uh, macro canidia. They're kind of pointed on the ends. And you can see the number of septations there. And this is a slide that's been stained with uh, another dye that's not lactophenol, lanolin blue. And you can just still see the same structures in this one. You can see that those macro canidia are extremely long, but they're curved on the ends. And sometimes they're pointed on the ends too. Fusarium is one that you will see in everyday life. It's a common organism to find uh, in, in the respiratory tract specimens, and so you will see it. It's not always a cause of disease, but I think from a normally sterile site, you need to make sure that uh, the clinician knows about it so that they can determine if it's significant or not. This is a culture where it looks like one that is kind of dark, almost lavender in appearance. And here you see one better with a kind of the, the lavender appearance to it too. And here's one that has some yellow present and also some red. And the reverse side of these plates, sometimes it's important to look at those at the back of the culture. And with one of these fusarium cultures that produces a kind of red colonies, you can see their back side is red. And more times than not fusarium, some of these fusariums will be red. That's what the fusarium looks like. And now we're going to look at another one that produces uh, canidia and clusters. However, it's not one that we see all that often. It's one called trichoderma. And trichoderma produces green colonies, it, but it produces canidia that are in slimy masses at the tip of a phyla, kind of like we talked about with acrimonium and fusarium. Canidia forests are hyaline and they're branched. The hyaline just means they're non-pigmented. The phyllids are inflated at the bottom and they, the canidia are produced at clusters attached at right angles to the canidia form and then the canidia are produced in slimy masses at the tips of these phyllids. So we're going to look at it. This, is, this one is slightly out of focus, but what happens is these phyllids are produced on a long stalk, okay, come off of a long stalk and they're pointed on the end and then they give rise to a cluster of these canidia like you see here. They're more rounded than anything else, not elongated like fusarium. And here you can see trichoderma. It almost looks like trichoderma produces these phyllids in a whirl. They're coming off kind of all the way around that whole thing, almost like a tree, like you see. And the one in the right hand side looks almost like a tree, if you have a vivid imagination. This is a culture of uh, trichoderma in its lawn green. And it, that's characteristic of that organism. So if you see a morpho morphologic features like you just saw, and you look at the culture and it's, it is lawn and green, you're going to know that it's uh, trichoderma. And this is another one showing you just another colony variation. So now we're going to look at another organism. This is one that produces canidia and clusters in a gelatinous mass at the tip of some structures. And it's not a single phyllid. It's a cluster of what look like phyllids that are produced that then give rise to this cluster of canidia. And this is one called glioclatium. And it's one that's not very often seen, but it is kind of one that I think if you see it once, you won't forget what it looks like. It has canidia fours that are kind of branched in the upper part, and so it gives rise to a cluster of these phyllids rather than single ones. And the canidia that it produces at the tip are one-celled. They're produced at the slimy masses like the other two things that we talked about at the tip of these phyllids. So we're still in that group. And here you can see 
at the top there are a cluster of these phyllids, and the phyllids are not long tube-like structures at all. They're more vase-shaped. They're rounded and inflated at the bottom, and they're kind of uh, tapered at the tip. And they come off all the way around. There's a cluster of those, and then what's happened is the cluster of conidia is produced at the tip of all of those phyllids. And I think once you see gliocladium, you won't forget what it looks like. And here's uh, where the, cu the culture has produced a huge number of conidia. Down below the mass of conidia would be those phyllids that are kind of arranged in a cluster. And you can see here, this is another one that is kind of lawn green.